So we're going to continue our talk on the STDs here with the ulcerative genital infections. This is very high yield for the test. Only, however, two of these are going to be high yield in real life. Okay, so, um, and really, to be honest, only one of these is going to be really, really high yield in real life. But uh, these come up all the time on the test, and so you want to be familiar with these. Particularly for step two, you'll want to know about all five of these. Step three, really, uh, only a couple of these come up. All right, so this, these are all going to be on your differential, uh, on, at least on the test. It will be on your differential uh, for the patient that comes in with a genital ulcer. Okay, so an ulcer, we mean an open sore. All right, so we have a 19-year-old college student coming in complaining of painful sores on her genitals. Okay, that's important, painful sores on her genitals for the last four days. She says that she doesn't know where they came from, and she's never had anything like this before. On further questioning, she says that she has had sex with one male partner about a month ago and is not sure if they used protection. You know, you get so many patients come in and they think they don't need to use protection because they're on birth control. And it doesn't work that way. Birth control does not prevent STDs. Uh, physical exam is remarkable, uh, unless you consider a baby an STD, but that's a whole other story. Okay, physical exam is remarkable for multiple bright red tender lesions extensively located on the labia majora and minora, anterior vagina, and along the posterior fourchette. There is no lymphadenopathy. The remainder of the physical exam is unremarkable. So here's what the lesions look like. They look like blisters. Maybe uh, ruptured blisters. Okay, This is genital herpes. And genital herpes is extremely common. This is the one you want to be most familiar with because this is the one you'll see in practice. Syphilis, yeah, not so much. Um, the other ones, no, you will not see them. The only place you'll ever see these other three, chancroid granuloma inguinale and uh, lymphogranuloma venereum or LGV, the only time you will ever see these, unless you go practice medicine in Africa, uh, third world countries, uh, the only time you're ever going to see these is on the test. And I know that I'm, this is a you know medical review for everybody, but you know, I, I'm really marketing these uh, lectures towards people who are taking the USMLE, uh, which is an American test focused on medicine in the United States, uh, but really applies to, you know, most industrialized countries. And in most industrialized countries, you're only going to see syphilis and genital herpes. Those are the only two you're going to see in practice. Chancroid, granuloma inguinale, lymphogranuloma venereum, very good to know for the test, but in real life, you just aren't going to see these. They're not common at all. Okay, so we'll start with syphilis. Syphilis is caused by tryponema pallidum, and tryponema pallidum is a slender, spiral-shaped, gram-negative spirochete. We call these spirochetes. And these are very thin-walled, and as a result, they don't really retain gram stain, although technically they are classified as gram-negative. The thing is, they're so thin-walled, they don't retain stain, and so the only way you're going to be able to view these is by a technique known as dark field microscopy, and that's why this is all black and then these are white. I'm not exactly sure how to do dark field microscopy, but that's how it's done, and you should know that for the test, because dark field microscopy might come up as your diagnostic test of choice. So the causative pathogen, as mentioned, is tryponema pallidum, and approximately 55,400 new cases were estimated to have taken place in the U.S. in 2008, so not terribly uncommon. Now, when you compare that to, uh, to genital herpes, there's about eight times more cases of genital herpes, so that's the most common out of all of these. Uh, but syphilis is not uncommon yet, uh, and uh, this occurs in multiple stages. So you want to be familiar with each of these stages because uh, syphilis may come up in different ways on the test, and they can look very different. Uh, so the primary way that syphilis shows up, and the reason we're talking about this under the umbrella of ulcerative genital infections, is the hallmark chancre. And this is primary syphilis. So this is the first way that syphilis shows up. And it usually takes a few weeks uh, after exposure for it to show up, uh, average uh, 
incubation period is three weeks, uh, but usually the chancre will show up in anywhere between 10 days to 12 weeks uh, after the actual infection. Uh, so the chancre is a painless round ulcer with raised borders. And in men, it occurs on the penis. Women, it can occur in all sorts of different places. So it can be on the vulva, it can be on the vagina, it can even be on the cervix. So you have to look very closely. Now the thing is, is that it's painless. Now it might cause a little bit of discomfort, but because it's painless, a lot of times women will not know that they have it if it's, if it's in the cervix or even in the vagina. Okay, if it's on the vulva, they'll probably know because they'll be able to see it. Now for men, it occurs on the penis. So they will almost certainly see it. So you can imagine that in women, there, it may be more likely to progress to secondary syphilis because they don't see it, they don't go in, they don't get treated. Okay, so I'm not sure what the exact uh, demographics, uh, epidemiology is, but uh, you know you can imagine that it can be more problematic in a woman because she might not see it. You know, she's got all those folds and you know in her genitals and everything. Okay, so usually it's going to be on the cervix, vagina, or vulva, and this will resolve spontaneously after about six weeks. The chancre is highly infectious, so the uh, the the material that weeps from it is full of uh, spirochetes. Uh, so in this stage, it's very easy to transmit it to somebody else. Okay, now remember, the chancre is painless. Now in real life, there might be some discomfort, but relative to the other ones, definitely relative to genital herpes, this is much less painless. Herpes, they're gonna come complaining about the pain. They're gonna say, I've got this rash and it hurts. The chancre, they'll say, oh, I've got this sore. It's maybe a little uncomfortable, but it doesn't really hurt that bad. And like I said, it's a round ulcer with raised borders. I'll show you a picture of that. Now, even though this doesn't fall under the theme of this lecture, which is ulcerative genital infections, it's good to know the other stages of syphilis. So secondary syphilis uh, usually will show up as a maculopapular rash. And it can involve the entire body, but it has a predilection for the palms, soles, and mucous membrane. So think the inside of the mouth. Uh, and so you'll see that. Uh, the other thing you'll see, and if you watch the talk on genital warts, this was on our differential, condyloma lata, which means broad knuckle. And that's how it kind of looks. These are broad, pink-gray exophytic lesions, which look similar to warts. They kind of are warts, uh, in a way of speaking. Uh, and then there may also be systemic symptoms in secondary syphilis, so headache, nausea, uh, loss of appetite, fever. Uh, and this, uh, these lesions are also infectious, so you will, uh, you will be able to transmit it to somebody else this way too. After that, uh, you go into latent syphilis, and you can go a long time without having any symptoms. Occasionally you may have secondary outbreaks, uh, but for the most part here, you're not infectious because you've got a lot of antibodies uh, that you've produced by this point. And then tertiary syphilis is quite rare nowadays because we treat it. We've usually picked it up by this point. Uh, but if it does go untreated, you go into tertiary syphilis, there can be all sorts of different ways that this can present. So it can manifest with those gummas. And those gummas are sort of tumor-like nodules, which might vary in size, but they can be all over the place. They can be in the face. They can be anywhere. Uh, you can also get neurosyphilis, and uh, the symptoms of this would be things like tabes dorsalis. That could come up on the test on neurology. So tabes dorsalis, you're basically losing, you get demyelination of the DCML tract, dorsal column medial lumniscus. And remember, that's your fine touch and proprioception. So you'll lose that. These patients oftentimes will have gait issues because they don't feel uh, the fine touch on their feet when they're walking. Uh, so that's tabes dorsalis. They can also get dementia from neurosyphilis, seizures. You can also see the Argo-Robertson pupils. Remember, those are the pupils that accommodate uh, when you're looking up closer, uh, but they don't react to light. And then there's also cardiovascular syphilis, which manifests as an aortitis, syphilitic aortitis. It can show up, but we don't see it that much. Uh, and then remember that it's possible if a woman is not treated for syphilis, uh, that she can give it to her neonate, uh, to her baby. And that's why we always test for syphilis uh, when we do, you know, sort of the uh, prenatal 
workup. And the science of congenital syphilis, just for review, you can get that nasal exudate uh, enlargement of the spleen and liver. They tend to feed poorly. Uh, a lot of times, infants of mothers affected with untreated syphilis will be born stillbirth. Uh, and then some of the later manifestations in children of mothers affected with syphilis, you can see those Hutchinson teeth, mulberry molars, uh, deafness, frontal bossing where they got a big prominent forehead, uh, the saddle nose, kind of a flat nose, and then the saver shim, so shims that kind of go outward. Okay, so we had a little bit of a review there. This is the distribution of syphilis in the United States. You can see uh, there are some locales that are more common than others. The darker blue are more common, but it really ranges. So you can see where I am in Minnesota, it's about 3.6. That's roughly the national average. Um, and then there are some places where it's much less common. Uh, apparently in Wisconsin, it's much less common. Not, not sure why that is. They're right next door. Uh, but uh, more common areas, Georgia, California, Florida, New York, Washington, D.C. is off the charts. Not exactly sure why that is. Probably in D.C. because there's a very high African-American population. African-Americans tend to be poorer than their white counterparts, unfortunately. Uh, and so it may be the lower socioeconomic status, which we know is a risk factor for syphilis. Other risk factors include, include uh, increased lifetime partners, early onset of sexual activity, and there is a higher incidence in adolescents compared to the rest of the population. So this is a shanker. It looks like it would be really painful, but it's actually not as painful as it looks. So you can see these sort of uh, smooth edges and uh, these, this red lesion. Okay. So pretty isolated. You don't see the generalized rash that you see in, in, in herpes. Okay, and like I said, this will go away after uh, about uh, over the course of several weeks, five or six weeks, two months at the most. Okay, here's another shanker. This is on the penis. You can see that up very close. You see nice smooth edges and then your ulcer here. And usually you only have one, maybe two of these. Okay, this is a secondary rash we're talking about in secondary syphilis. Maculopapular rash, predilection for the palms and soles. And you may see this in conjunction with the condyloma lata. Okay, now it's very difficult to tell this sometimes from, from the, uh, the more verrucous appearing HPV rash, uh, or sorry, HPV wart. Uh, but just look at the patient's history, okay? If you look at the patient's history and you see that they have a history of a chancre, then this is probably condyloma lata. If they don't, then it's probably the more common uh, condyloma cuminata. Okay, again here, condyloma lata. Lata is Latin for broad, wide. Like the tensor fascia lata. That's a muscle in your leg, if you remember back to M1 anatomy. Okay, so what do we do for diagnosis? Well, if it's very, very, very early on, unfortunately the VDRL RPR, which you think of is the best test for syphilis, and a lot of times it is, uh, a really good test for syphilis. If it's right only a couple weeks after they got infected or the, the, the uh, lesion has been there, that might not come back positive because that's really testing for the immune response, the antibodies. Um, and so really the best way to test this from the very, very, very beginning is to look for the spirochetes. And so what you do is you take a little bit of that lesion exudate, you do dark field microscopy, you know you're going to have spirochetes because if you have a syphilitic lesion, there's going to be spirochetes there. So dark field microscopy is never going to fail you as a good test. The problem is it's difficult and you know you have to know what you're doing uh, if you're doing microscopy. Know what you're looking for. Now on the other hand, a lot of times it's just much easier to get blood and send it off to the lab. And if the patient has had the lesion for more than a, couple, uh, a week or two, in which in many cases they will, uh, you can get a VDRL and RPR test. And this is, but this is a screening test. So you can get false positives with this test, uh, unfortunately. 
so uh, some of the ways you get false positives with the BDRL is uh, like if they have a collagen vascular disease, occasionally if they're pregnant, they can come back false positive. If they've ever had TB, uh, if they have a cancer, uh, you can get false positives. So routinely, if they come back with a positive VDRL RPR, even if they, uh, if we really think they've got syphilis, routinely we send it off for a confirmatory test, and that's the FTA ABS. Something, trypanema, antigen, something. I don't know what it stands for. FTA ABS. Uh, and that is much more specific and much more accurate at diagnosing it. So this is more of our confirmatory test. Kind of like ELISA and Western blot for AIDS, or HIV, sorry. Uh, so uh, if you get a question on the test and it's very early on, uh, you, dark field microscopy is probably the best way to go. If you're doing a screening for syphilis, uh, like you would in a pregnant woman, where you're t making sure she doesn't have syphilis as part of your prenatal test, VDRL RPR. If you're confirming that it's syphilis after you get a positive VDRL RPR, then you get the FTA ABS. The treatment for syphilis is penicillin. Okay, this is something you learned second year of medical school. You should know this. Okay, treatment for syphilis is benzathine penicillin G. Now, you may have a patient who is allergic to penicillin. As long as she's not pregnant, you can give her doxycycline. Okay, and so you're giving 2.4 million units of benzathine penicillin just once, intramuscularly. You give them the shot, done. Okay, you don't need to do anything else. They'll be cured of their syphilis. If she is allergic, you can do doxycycline, but you got to make sure she's not pregnant first. Okay, you cannot, you don't want to give doxycycline to pregnant women because the baby will come out and when they start teething and their teeth erupt, they'll be stained and gross. So no doxycycline for pregnant women. Um, and then what you'll do is you'll follow up in six months doing a repeat VDRL. Uh, you'll get the titers should go down by uh, a magnitude of four times. Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about is genital herpes. Genital herpes is caused by the herpes simplex virus. And this is a double-stranded DNA virus which affects sensory neurons and subsequently it is transported retrograde to the uh, dorsal root ganglia uh, where it then develops a lifelong latency. And so it, once you get genital herpes, you get HSV, you got it for life. Even though we can treat it, we can help the out with the outbreaks, we can help prevent the outbreaks, you'll never get rid of the herpes virus. A lot like varicella. Once you get it, you got it for life. And a lot of ways this presents kind of looks like chicken pox in some ways. We'll see some similarities. Uh, so uh, what can happen is that you go on later in life, you, get the, you, you have herpes, you have your first outbreak, and then you're fine for a while. And then you can get this just spontaneous reactivation, uh, which can be triggered by like stressors, like if you get an illness, even like common cold, um, emotional stress, fatigue, pregnancy, menstruation, sun exposure, things like that can cause you to transport this virus back from the dorsal root ganglia, anterograde down the nerve, uh, and back uh, to the skin where you can get an outbreak again. Okay, so this is what it looks like. They look very vesicular, uh, sort of, um, uh, they look kind of like blisters, and then the blisters break, and then you have these ulcers, and then the ulcers eventually crust over. So the causative pathogen is herpes simplex virus. Now there's two forms of herpes simplex virus, HSV1 and HSV2. The, the uh, sort of usually gets thrown around out there, common wisdom, is that HSV1 is more implicated in the oral herpes, cold source. HSV2 is more implicated in genital herpes. But this is not always the case. Okay, so it's not set in stone. Uh, and furthermore, you can get Gen you can get herpes from the genitals of your partner, and if you're having oral sex, you wind up with that on your mouth. It really doesn't matter here, okay? So once, because uh, once you have it, you have it forever. So uh, really, herpes is herpes. Uh, 776,000 cases were estimated in the U.S. in 2008. So this is by far the most common ulcerative genital infection that we're talking about here. As mentioned, lifelong infection with periodic reactivation. Incidentally, genital herpes is more common in women than in men. 
Don't really know why that is. A lot of cases go undiagnosed. So this is really uh, a lot fewer people than, or, or a lot more people than were probably actually diagnosed with herpes. So this is the number of cases estimated to have happened in the U.S. in 08. Okay, the manifestations. This is a painful rash. Really, it's more of a rash than a, a solitary ulcer. This is much more of a rash because you have so many of them all over the place. Uh, so these are blisters. They're painful. And in women, they tend to happen on the vulva and labia, but really it can be all over the place. It can be on the perineum, around the anus. Uh, it can be, you know, over the genitals. It can be like I said, all sorts of different places. Uh, and what happens is you get, you usually get this prodrome, so this sort of itching and burning, a lot like what you see in shingles, and then you get these sort of blisters that occur, and then and these are very painful, and the patient will be picking at these, and ultimately what happens then is that the, the blister roof comes off, and then they're ulcers, and then the ulcers over time will heal. Uh, and this will take this will occur over the process of a few weeks. Now, when it's a vesicle and then a sort of blister uh, and then it's an ulcer, during this period you have sort of fluid coming out of it, lots of viral shedding. So you're very contagious during that period. Once they crust over, you're a little less contagious. But as long as you have visible sores, you're considered contagious. Uh, so, very contagious over the first couple weeks. Uh, viral load and immune status is associated with severity and duration. So what causes you to have a higher viral load. Well, if it's your first infection, you're probably going to have a higher, higher viral load because you haven't made all the antibodies as you will have later. Uh, so usually the first infection, the primary infection, is the worst you'll get. And then secondary infections uh, are a little bit better because you have some antibodies uh, to kind of rein the infection in once it starts. Uh, so usually the first infection will be the worst. Also, if you have HIV, where your cell counts are going down, then if you had herpes already and now you're getting secondary outbreak and you have HIV on top of that and your CD4 count's going down, then you can expect that your outbreaks are going to be worse. So the viral load and immune status is associated with severity and duration. So not only will it be worse, but you'll also have it for a longer period of time, probably longer than those three weeks. That is usually the average. Okay, so this is what they look like. You can see these are obviously blister-like in appearance. And eventually these blister roofs will come off and then they'll look like ulcers, like this here. And they're very, very painful. Herpes hurts. Okay. Unlike syphilis, it doesn't hurt that much. More uncomfortable than anything else. I don't know this from personal experience. Promise. Okay, diagnosis. For herpes, uh, Traditionally, it's a culture of the lesion fluid. The thing is, it, that's not a very sensitive test. Okay? So it doesn't diagnose all the people who actually have it. For the most part, this has been supplanted by getting the lesion fluid and doing a PCR on it. Um, the problem with that is it's a little bit more expensive. So I would know both of these. But you're getting the lesion fluid, you're either doing a culture or you're doing a PCR. You're not going to get asked between the two of these on the test. Um, unless they want to ask you which is the most sensitive test, but I don't expect that. Uh, so you'll be asked for one of these as far as what's the best test for diagnosis, the best step in diagnosis. Um, so uh, you've got to diagnose this. You can't just treat this presumptively. You know, Make sure this is diagnosed, and then the treatment is going to be acyclovir. Now, how much acyclovir you give is going to depend on whether this is a primary outbreak a secondary outbreak, or if you're using acyclovir for suppressive therapy. So you don't have to worry about the dosage, but do know that the dosage and the time period over which you give the acyclovir is going to vary based on whether this is the first episode, if it's uh, a secondary outbreak, or if you're giving this to suppress, uh, to prevent another outbreak from happening. Now, other alternatives are famcyclovir, uh, known as famvir, and valacyclovir, which is also known as Valtrex. Valacyclovir has an advantage here in a, in a practical way because with acyclovir, you have to take it three times a day uh, or twice a day if you're using it for suppressive therapy. With valacyclovir, 
you only have to take it twice a day or once a day. So just for that matter, it's more convenient for the patient. Uh, but if you're asked on the test what's the best treatment, acyclovir is the one we have the most experience with, so that will probably be the right answer on the test. Uh, but famcyclovir, valacyclovir are also used. You can give them analgesics because this is really painful. Something like code, uh, Tylenol with codeine uh, is usually good enough for the pain. You can also give them a topical an analgesic, like uh, uh, you can use like topical lidocaine cream. Uh, that works too. Uh, so usually analgesics uh, are given along with the antiviral. And then you want to make sure you educate them uh, that this is transmitted sexually. As long as you have the lesions, avoid sexual intercourse. And then with women, you got to make sure you let them know that there can be OB complications. Uh, so if they do get pregnant, you want to make sure that they are telling their gynecologist, whoever their primary doctor is, whoever is going to be doing the delivery, uh, that they have herpes so that they can keep an eye on that. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is the chancroid. Now we're going to be talking about things that are not very common in the U.S., so I'm going to kind of go through these and only tell you the stuff you need to know for the test because... It's just not common. And I struggled to find pictures uh, to illustrate this for you. Uh, so, I, it, you know, it really frustrates me that the test gives you a lot of questions on this because you just don't see it that much. Um, as far as chancroid, only 24, uh, only 24 cases were diagnosed in the U.S. in 2010. So it's not, not common. All right, so the causative pathogen for chancroid is Haemophilus ducreae. All right, and this is a non-modal, non-spore-forming, gram-negative anaerobe. All right, so like I said, this is very rare in the U.S. Only 24 cases were reported in 2010, and the U.S. is a very big country, over 300 million people, so only 24 people got it. The clinical manifestations. This is the other one that's painful. So herpes and chancroid are painful. And this is a, an erythematous papule, which then goes on to ulcerate into this ul uh, ulcer. Ulcerates into an ulcer. That's kind of redundant. Uh, but over about two days, this papule will turn into an ulcer. And it's very red and raggy and has these sort of edges uh, that are not really well defined, if you look here. Kind of not very smooth edges. Uh, in some ways, this looks a lot like the syphilitic chancre, and that's where it gets its name, chancroid, uh, from. But compared to the chancre, this is going to be softer and much more tender. Uh, so the patient will tell you that this is painful. Uh, this usually occurs on the labia. It can also occur on the clitoris, the vestibule, or the posterior fourchette. It, if you forgot what the posterior fourchette is, that's fine. It's not a very commonly used anatomic term. But that's just the part in the back where the labia come together. Okay? So in the front, it kind of comes together around the, like where the clitoris is. In the back, we just call that the posterior fourchette. About 50% of patients with chancroid will also have a tender inguinal lymphadenopathy. Now, even though we associate lymphadenopathy with the other one we're going to talk about, which is lymphogranuloma venereum, you can have lymphadenopathy in chancroid, but not all the time. Diagnosis for chancroid is going to be a culture or gram stain of the lesion contents. We're looking for Haemophilus ducreae. And the treatment here is going to be azithromycin. So as long as you know really the treatment for chancroid, that's the most important one. Know that it's a painful lesion and the treatment is azithromycin. I would say that's pretty much what you need to know for the test. Right, so this is going to be how it shows up. I'm not sure exactly what this is. If this is a cadaver or what's going on here. Okay, so the other one, uh, another one we're going to talk about is granuloma inguinale. Again, very, very uncommon. Less than 100 cases were diagnosed in the U.S. Uh, in 2010. So granuloma inguinale is caused by a bacteria, and uh, that bacteria is known as Klebsiella granulomatis, or this big word, Calamatobacterium granulomatis. Okay, so granuloma inguinale is also known as donovanosis. Uh, you may hear that word thrown around. This is an intracellular bacteria, so when you look at it under a microscope, you'll see the bacteria are within cells. We call these Donovan bodies. 
The manifestations of granuloma inguinale is a painless inflammatory nodule, which then progresses to this really ugly, angry looking red ulcer, and it very easily bleeds. It's a very vascular uh, ulcer, and so it's gonna, this will bleed very easily. And when it heals, all of that circulation causes a very profuse fibrotic reaction, and this will often look like a keloid uh, sort of scar when it heals. Uh, so very ugly. Uh, and the lymph nodes are usually uninvolved. So remember the term beefy red. That gets thrown around for some reason, and I bet it will come up on the test. If they're going to give you something that is really rare, they should make it somewhat obvious for you. Um, usually when this happens, it'll be in outbreaks, or it will be in a patient who's recently traveled overseas to a lesser industrialized country. Diagnosis is microscopy of the ulcer base contents. You'll take, you'll, you'll swab this, and then you'll look under the microscope. And what you're really looking for is not so much the uh, the bacteria itself, but the cells, which will have these Donovan bodies in it. Uh, and I already showed you a picture of that. Uh, and the treatment is doxycycline. And the problem with granuloma inguinale is that it takes forever for it to heal. And so you have to give this at least three weeks, but in a lot of cases, you're going to be giving this for months on end. Uh, so doxycycline every day until the lesion heals. Uh, an alternative, let's say if the woman is pregnant, uh, you can give erythromycin, which is pregnancy class B. Uh, you can't give doxycycline, remember, because it stains your teeth. It stains baby's teeth. Uh, so you can give uh, erythromycin. Now, the problem with that one is that you have to give it four times a day, so that's a pain in the butt. Okay, so this is granuloma inguinale. You see it all over the place. Very beefy, angry, red, almost maroon-like lesion. Here it is on the penis. Uh, so it can be really small or it can be really big. Now, uh, these lesions oftentimes will get pus on them. Uh, or not really pus, but sort of exudate. Uh, so you may note that, too. Uh, you want to make sure, though, that if you are taking a, a, a sample of this lesion that you don't take it from that. You want to clean that off first. Okay. Okay, the last one we're going to talk about is lymphogranuloma venereum LGV. I've seen this one come up on the test a few times when I've looked over all these practice tests. I've seen this one come up, but they're going to give you something about this one that will really help you uh, identify it. So that's the one good thing, I guess. With granuloma inguinale, it's going to be a beefy red lesion. With lymphogranuloma venereum, it's going to be something called the groove sign, and that is what we have right here. Talk about that in a little bit. So lymphogranuloma venereum is actually caused by something that we are already familiar with, chlamydia trachomatis, which is the same thing that causes chlamydia. It causes the uh, cervicitis. However, it's caused by a different serovar of chlamydia. It's caused by serovars uh, L1 through L3. Uh, but this is a gram-negative bacteria. It's an obligate intracellular parasite, the exact same way that uh, that chlamydia trachomatis that causes cervicitis acts. Really the same mode of, uh, of, of being. Uh, it's just a different serotype. Uh, not common in the U.S. Uh, actually, we've even stopped taking, the government stopped keeping track of it because it's so rare. Uh, so if you... If you get a test question on this, look for a history of, of international travel. The manifestations of LGV is a small painless vesicle uh, or papule, which is then followed by this way that this shows up. It's inguinal lymph adenopathy. You will never see a test question on LGV that doesn't tell you that they have inguinal lymph adenopathy. And this inguinal lymph adenopathy is chock full of this nasty material that has uh, the... Uh, the pathogen in it, uh, along with some pus, and um, you, what's going to usually happen is that they get lymphadenopathy on either side of the inguinal ligament. So you can see here, here's the inguinal ligament coming down here, and here's lymphadenopathy here, and lymphadenopathy here, and we call this middle area here where we have the inguinal ligament, no lymph node, we call that a groove, and this is what we call the groove sign. So you just have lymphadenopathy on either side of the inguinal ligament, the groove sign. The test will tell you 
They might not tell you groove sign, but they'll give you a picture like this. They might tell you groove sign too. Uh, they should make these rare ones somewhat easier. Okay, uh, another thing that can happen with LGB is something called anogenital rectal syndrome. Uh, in this case, this can be pretty pretty bad. Uh, so they'll get some rectal itching, some mucoid discharge from these ulcers, which are occurring in their rectum. Uh, ultimately, these can bleed. They can become infected. They can even get so deep into the tissue that they cause a rectal perforation, which can then lead to peritonitis and all the terrible things that come with that. Uh, so that is one of the uh, possible ways that this can show up. But just, if you're going to remember anything with LGV, remember the groove sign. That will probably get you the test question, uh, the right answer uh, on the test. For diagnosis, well, you got these big, huge lymph nodes here that have all this nasty stuff in it. That's going to be what you're going to look for because these vesicles, really, they're not the main star of the show here. It's, it's these lymph nodes. So you're going to aspirate the lymph nodes, culture the pus, and you're looking for uh, chlamydia trachomatis. That'll be how you diagnose this. This is so rare. You're never going to do this in real life, but for the test, that's what you do. Uh, the treatment for LGB is doxycycline. Uh, you can also use Bactrim, but doxycycline is going to be the right answer on the test. And this is how it shows up. Okay, so here you have a lot of these nasty-looking ulcers, uh, but you'll see groove sign. That's probably going to be how it comes up on the test. Okay, so yes, this is a man. You can see the ulcers here, uh, but you can see lymphadenopathy here. Not so good of a groove, but... Uh, just take it or leave it, I guess. I couldn't find a whole lot of pictures on LGB. Okay, so to recap, these two are the ones you want to know for real life uh, and for step three. Step three is usually a little more practical. That's why it's easier. Um, oh, sorry, there goes my phone. Okay. Um, so syphilis, uh, remember three stages. First shows up as a genital mass, the chancre. Relatively painless ulcer with these rolled, smoother-looking edges. Uh, and then if it's not treated, several weeks later, it'll go on to secondary syphilis where you get the rash, uh, you get uh, the condyloma lata, uh, and then malaise. Uh, and then the tertiary disease is systemic. That can be all sorts of awful things. Uh, to diagnose this, dark field microscopy at any point, you can use dark field microscopy uh, as long as you have a nice weeping lesion. Uh, otherwise, the VDRL RPR. And the treatment for syphilis is penicillin. You better know that for the test. Genital herpes, painful pruritic rash. This isn't just an ulcer, this is a rash because it's all over the place. Genital papules and vesicles in various stages of healing. Kind of looks like chicken pox uh, or looks like, uh, uh, not herpes, uh, shingles. Uh, so, genital papules and vesicles, what do we do to uh, for diagnosis here, HSV culture or PCR of the lesion fluid. Treatment is acyclovir. Chancroid is the painful ulcer that's got a ragged red edge. Uh, we uh, treat, the, this is rare again here, but this one is also painful. Uh, we get a culture of the ulcer secretion uh, and uh, then uh, this is treated with azithromycin. All right, um, and then uh, the granuloma inguinale, painless ulcer. It's beefy and red. They'll probably tell you beefy red in, in appearance on the test. Uh, you diagnose this via microscopy, looking for the Donovan body. And then the treatment here is doxycycline or Bactrim. I think I just told you Bactrim you could use for LGB. You can't. Uh, Bactrim you use for granuloma inguinale. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, you can tell I've never treated this before. Okay, LGV, lymphogranuloma venerium, painless ulcer. It's where you get the groove sign. Uh, and that's caused from inguinal adenopathy. So with LGV, you're going to aspirate the lymph node, get the pus, do a culture, uh, look, and you're going to look for uh, chlamydia trachomatis. And the treatment for LGV is doxycycline. So the one big one that I want you to remember as far as these three rare ones that you're never going to come in contact with as far as treatment, with chancroid, it's azithromycin. With the other two, it's doxycycline. And then remember uh, beefy red for granuloma inguinale and groove sign for LGV. If you remember those, you're 
probably good to go. All right. So to recap, these are the causes. Now I've seen some test questions come up, especially with these three rare ones, where they give you a, the, a classic clinical picture, make it really obvious what it is, and then you think, okay, this is chancroid, or this is LGV, or this is granuloma and gonali. But then the question is actually, which of the following organisms is the pathogen behind this disease? And it's like, oh crap, I don't remember the organisms behind these. So I would remember uh, that uh, what these organisms are. So for syphilis, it's Trebonema pallidum. You probably remember that already. With herpes, it's herpes simplex virus. Okay, so chancroid, it's Haemophilus ducre. Granulum and guanali is Klebsiella uh, or uh, Calimatobacteria, whatever, granulomatous. If you remember, it's a big long word. You're probably fine. And then uh, LGV is Chlamydia trachomatis. So you're just going to have to memorize these because, you know, unlike uh, herpes where you kind of have the name in the, in the pathogen, these you just don't. So you're just going to have to put these on flashcards and memorize them. This might come up this way on the test. I've seen quite a few questions where it does that. These are, you know, your 98th percentile questions. They have to put some questions on there that not everybody's going to get. And only a few people are going to get. So, you know, you can sort out the high scores from the lower scores. Uh, so if you really are gunning for a super high score, then memorize those. Otherwise, best thing to know is how you diagnose and how you treat and which ones are painful. All right, so if you have any questions, write me a note below. Otherwise, I'll see you next time. Our next talk is going to be on some of the pruritic lesions that are infectious, namely scabies and uh, a couple other things. All right, so we'll see you next time.